I have been thinking about and praying about this topic, uh, wrestling this over. This is another one of those thoughts that comes from my my childhood and, and growing up in church and coming up in ministry and being a pastor's son and you hear these phrases and statements. And when you go into ministry, you preach them a, way, a certain way and you feel a certain way about them. And then when you have a, a real revelation of the love of the Father and the finished work and grace, some things start to shift in the way you interpret scripture or the way you interpret stories. That's happened to me more times than I can count with, with mostly the Old Testament stories that I framed in a certain light never really thought about how Jesus affects that story. So I've went back over the last decade and really reinserted the finished work or for the first time inserted the finished work into those moments. And that's caused all kinds of stuff to happen. That sends you down all kinds of roads because you start to end, the roads start to end at Jesus instead of ending with you getting a principle. And principles are fine. I mean, you need principles we all have them, whether we know it or not. It just depends on what they are. But the, the road of ministry starts and stops. He's the author and the finisher is Jesus. So this is another one of those, those statements. And my title says it all, a man after God's own heart. It's one of those thoughts that uh, has, has been bandied about forever. And when I come up in Pentecostal and charismatic world, um, that was... I don't want to say that was our goal, but that was certainly one of the goals is you wanted to be one of the people who was after God's own heart. And how could we define that? What did that mean? And we got all kinds of stuff. I and mean, there was never really, you could never really nail it down what it meant, but it was someone who was special. It was someone who was anointed. It was someone who was favored and blessed and someone who exemplified all of the qualities of God that made God who he is. And I wanted it. And I, I remember from, the, from my earliest age thinking, that's what I want to be. That I want to be, I want to end up someday and be a man after God's own heart, which is a, a great goal, but I didn't understand how to get there. Um, I didn't understand how Jesus came to make that not just a possibility, but to make that our reality. And I, because I didn't know that, and if you don't understand the finished work, or what Jesus has done, then you may go about things to try to make it happen on your own. So for me, to be a man after God's own heart meant you're going to have to be better than ordinary. You're going to have to be extraordinary. You're gonna, so you're going to have to see what is average and then exceed it. So, and that doesn't take long to do when you're in church all of the time. So you just kind of look around the landscape. All you're really doing is comparing yourself against other people anyway. So you look around the landscape and go, well, what's the average person read? Well, then I should be above that. When you get into ministry, what's the other, what's the average preacher? How much do they read and pray and fast and study and get? Okay, well, then you should exceed that because David's exceptional. He's not like the other guys running around Israel. If he's a man after God's own heart, then you're going to have to be better. And I just gave away what the scripture, David is the character, of course. I don't think that's a real secret. Most of us know that that's who the Bible says had the heart of God. And so I want to take you into the New Testament to read a reference to that man. And most of our stuff tonight on the screen is, is text, um, just because that's the way I felt led to do it. And just let some of this stuff, um, let us discover it together as we go. Not a, not a whole lot pre-planned other than the texts I want to go to. Uh, and just to try to show you this, this story of this man. In Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 16, Paul stands up and motions with his hands as men of Israel and you who fear God. This is an incorporation of both Israel and, and Gentiles because the conjunction and you who fear God is not as if men of Israel don't, but it's men of Israel, and some translations will even say men of Israel and Gentiles who believe. And so Paul's including every one of us, men of Israel and you who fear God. Listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. It's just a retelling, just a slow, steady, Pauline retelling of the Israel story. I always love these. You'll find a few of these in Acts. They're the closest thing you get to a Paul sermon on CD. It's like a written transcript of a Paul or a Peter or a John or a Stephen sermon. I love them, not just because of what you get, but what gets left out. And you, you watch the things they show you and the things they don't show you. 
And that doesn't mean they didn't believe the things they don't show you, but it just shows the emphasis of the first generation church on what was important in the story. There's a lot of peripherals when you read, but they're really giving you the sort of the main line. And so this is a real main, real simple. He brings them up. They were strangers in the land of Egypt. He brings them up with an uplifted arm. Next verse. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land to them by allotment. There's a lot there at risk of being on this for too long. I'll simply say this. He throws in seven nations that God removed out of their way so that he could give them the land. He doesn't talk about wrath. He doesn't talk about anger. He doesn't talk about genocide. All the stuff people try to dredge up and say, this is, oh, look, 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 look at your God of the Old Testament. The first generation church looks back and sees God in the Old Testament and says there was a justice that needs served on seven nations. Seven is a, is a number of rest, completion, and perfection. So God had to bring the land into perfect justice. It wasn't a matter of, of uh, God preferring one people over the other. It's never been the heart of God to prefer one people over the other. He loves, O men of Israel, and you who fear God, always. So it was never, well, he liked the Israelites, but he hated the Philistines. No, there was a justice that needed served on their lives and their lifestyles, and, this, and the author brings that in. He distributes to their land to them by allotment. That means which tribe gets which piece of property, 20. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years. He's, ch he's chunking out a lot of time here. He's not wasting a lot of time. Highlights, highlights, highlights. You jump all the way through the judges. That's 450 years until Samuel. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, and here's our phrase, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. We don't get much. We don't get a lot about David. What we did learn here is that he's the second king. He follows Saul. That God chose him because he was a man after God's own heart. And the closest we get to figuring out what a man after God's own heart means is he'll do all of God's will. There's no Goliath, there's no Mephibosheth, there's no Jonathan, there's no Bathsheba. There's none of the stuff that identifies David. There's no psalmist, there's no shepherd. All of the things that make David pop in our biography, when we talk about David, none of it's there. What is there? He's a man after God's own heart. No real description He's, other than he does the will of God. So what, what we have, if we're detectives in this and we have to determine how is he a man after God's own heart, the only thing we get is he does all of God's will and his great, 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 great grandkid is Jesus. One of his, one of, in his lineage comes Jesus. Well, he's not a man after God's own heart because of his great, 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 great grandkid because then all of the people in that line would be after God's heart. Why, why pick David as if he's the chief of that lineage? Goliath, warrior, shepherd, psalmist, none of that stuff even pops in the verse. We don't get any of that. But we do see one interesting phrase, that he does all my will. Now, at risk of putting way too much into one statement, at what point in his life does he do God's will? Because there's a whole bunch of moments in his life where he doesn't do God's will. I mean, you can pick the Bathsheba moment as sort of the highlight moment in his life where it's certainly not God's will to commit adultery. It's certainly not God's will to murder her husband. It's certainly not God's will to play cover up for a good year. We know it happens at least for a year because the baby's alive before he gets caught. You can do the math. Um, he hasn't told anyone for quite some time. He's not quick to repent. It's not as if he sins and then runs to God to get things taken care of. I've and I've had and heard all kinds of theories on what makes David a man after God's heart. Well, he's a, he's a man after God's heart because he was anointed. Well, so was Samuel. He's in this text. He was anointed and chosen. A horn of oil poured over his head. The scripture doesn't say Samuel was a man after God's own heart. Yeah. So what makes David a man after God's own heart? Um, what doesn't make him a man after God's own heart? So we've talked about the Bathsheba incident, the adultery, the murder, the cover-up. None of those things can work. What about the anointing? Again, Samuel's in this text. Samuel's anointed, but Samuel's not called the man after God's own heart. 
What about being a warrior, dropping a Goliath? The text doesn't say it, but we know that's part of David's thing. He's a general. He's a king that goes forth to battle. He, he kills the lion and the bear. He protects his sheep. He's definitely a warrior. If that makes him a man after God's own heart, so is Saul. Saul's a warrior. So what makes David, is he a better warrior than Saul? I don't know. Um, is he the greatest warrior that ever lived? Probably not. Does that make him a man after God's own heart? If so, what does that say about God? God's a warrior. God likes to kill people with slingshots and cut their head off with their own sword. I mean, we're making the assumptions that the text says David's a man after God's own heart. So what makes David a man after God's own heart? He's not quick to repent necessarily. Um, and God needs not repent anyway. So how would David resemble the heart of God by being quick to repent? Jesus is a shepherd. In fact, John says he's a good shepherd. David was a shepherd. Is being a shepherd what makes him a man after God's own heart? I don't think so because all of Israel were shepherds. Remember, that's what Joseph tells his brothers in Egypt is when you go meet Pharaoh, don't tell him you're shepherd because shepherds are an abomination. And they walk in and say, we're shepherds, which is total opposition to what they were told to say. Um, there's a little jab at Joseph there, I think. But Point being, being a shepherd didn't make them men after God's own heart. So what is it that does it? None of these are necessarily unique to David. So let me give you one that does set David apart and I think gets us on the right road to checking out, to discovering if David's a man after God's own heart. And that is the great 51st Psalm. Because the 51st Psalm, David writes most of the book of Psalms, not all, but most of the book of Psalms, and the definitely writes the 51st Psalm. It's a Psalm that he writes after he is confronted by the prophet Nathan, Nathan comes to him, gives him that little story about a man having a sheep and a guest comes to his house and they, a guest comes to his neighbor's house and he doesn't want to kill one of his own lambs. So he goes down the road and kills his neighbor's one lamb. And David gets mad and says, tell me who this guy is. I'm going to kill him. And Nathan says, you're the guy because you took what didn't belong to you that was precious to someone else. And it's in that moment that David starts to feel bad and acknowledges that he has sinned. It's quite some time after the fact, by the way. But it's in that moment that he acknowledges that he has sinned. And David sits down and pens a song. And in that song, he confesses. He doesn't give the specifics of his sin, what he's done wrong, but in that song, he, he talks about how he is repentant and how his sin is ever before him and he needs purged and he needs cleansed. I wanna read for you a few verses from Psalm 51. Uh, I was going to read the whole chapter, but I think that I know me, and so I don't really want to do that because I don't want to get stuck there for too terribly long. But let me show you a few verses from that. Psalms 51, verse 14, says this, Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart. I'm sorry. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. And I want you to listen to a couple of things that sound completely outside of an old covenant mentality. Okay? Listen to this phrase. You do not desire sacrifice, else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Now we're in the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament you're supposed to sacrifice, and you're supposed to give burnt offerings. So what gives David the right, when he's repenting of his sins, to say, you don't want to sacrifice, and you don't want a burnt offering? Frankly, nothing gives David the right. There's not a verse in the Old Testament that tells you, now God doesn't really want this, so... If you can think of a better way to repent, then repent that way. David prays outside of his context. He prays outside of his covenant. He's supposed to be offering a lamb or a bull. He's rich, so he's supposed to offer a bull. And pour the blood around the altar. But instead he prays and says that God doesn't want those things. God's not looking for a sacrifice. God's not looking for, for uh, blood to be shed. Instead, what God wants is my heart to change. God wants my heart to break. He wants, my, he wants a sacrifice that comes from the inside. I like to call this David's new covenant prayer. David prays a new covenant prayer in old covenant world because he's asking not for what can I give to God. He's asking, I've been broken. My sin has broken me. Will you take a broken man? I, you don't want sacrifice. 
You don't want burnt offering. The sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So I'll start by saying this. This is my first foray into what maybe makes David a man after God's own heart is that David thinks like a new covenant man. Is that enough to be called the man after God's own heart? Um, how is that doing completely God's will? I'm not sure. I don't, I, I don't adhere to that, although I love this. I love the fact that David prays a new covenant prayer in an old covenant world. But I'm not really sure that's what makes David a man after God's own heart. Instead, I want to take you again. We were in Acts 13 where we opened because in Acts 13, Paul preaches that God picked David to be a king, a man after his own heart. Two chapters later, the early church has their first real counsel. They've come up against their first real problem. And the problem is non-Jews are receiving Jesus. They didn't think this was even possible. How could a non-Jew receive the Messiah of Israel? He's the Messiah of Israel. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So what are all these Romans and Corinthians and Syrians and all these people who claim they, they're getting baptized? Are they really saved? Are they really the same as we are? This seems like such a silly debate to us, but can you imagine the first century? It's the one thing to debate is this. We've been preaching that this is our Messiah. He delivers us. If he's also saving Gentiles, we need to reassess what we're being delivered from. Because if he's also saving Gentiles, maybe it's not about a nation of people being accelerated over all the other people. Because if he saves both the Gentile and the Jew, then what's, he, what's, what's the end game for God? Because for Israel, the end game had been they, they are the chief nation on the earth. The, the land is theirs. If God's bringing everybody else in, then maybe we should reassess. Maybe the goal is not one people. Maybe the goal is the world. So they come together to argue this point, and Peter stands and says, look, I went to the house. He, he retells the Acts 10 incident. I went to the house of Cornelius. I preached the gospel to these Italians. They received. They were all filled with the Spirit. They began to speak with tongues. Only thing I can assume is God must receive them the way He receives us. It sounds like this when he says it, Acts 15, 6. The apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter, and there had been much dispute. Peter said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. By the way, that a good while ago was five chapters ago in your text because that happens in Acts 10. So we've had a good span there. Farther than it, there's a wider span there than it appears when you're reading the book of Acts. Uh, they should hear the word of gospel and believe. Next verse. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction. This is an important verse. He made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. For God, there is no more us and them. That's Peter's statement. For God, no more us and them. No more us, preferred people, Israel. No more them, heathen, vagabonds, strangers, aliens. These are terms Paul will use. Okay, Peter's a little bit different in his approach, but he's saying no difference to God between us and them. He purified their hearts by Faith, there becomes the key word of the new covenant. You purify their hearts not by what they do, but by what they believe. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you test God? By putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, I know we're talking about a man after God's own heart. It's like, why are we slowing down with this stuff? Because this is the lead-in. And this is important because this will prompt us to be introduced to a very rarely talked about incident from the Old Testament. But notice that Peter says, why are we testing God by putting a, a yoke on the neck of these new converts that neither our fathers nor we could bear? In other words, we couldn't ever do it. We, the Jews of the first century, we could never do it. Us or our fathers. Who are our fathers? Stretch it all the way back to Moses. Moses couldn't do it. His kids couldn't do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here we are. None of us can bear the yoke. Why are we in this room talking about what Gentiles need to do to really be saved? None of us could do anything either. So if I can't do it and you can't do it, what makes you think the new guy can do it? Why were we going to put a yoke on them that we couldn't bear? I, I think this is an important moment in the, in the New Testament. Because this is a moment of admission that they could not do the law of Moses. It broke them. They were incapable of carrying the yoke of the law 
but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved in the same manner that they shall be saved. So salvation becomes a grace work by faith, and it happens the same to a Jew and a Gentile. There's no difference. That we, we don't get in one way and they get in another way. If you're still hearing a version of the gospel where you come in by faith, but maybe Israel comes in because they have a, a different covenant, Peter would disagree from Acts 15. Peter, Peter heard that message. That's the message that brought this group into that room. Well, there's one covenant for one people and one for another. We can't all be the same. And Peter goes, no, I'm telling you, there's no difference in us and them. We got in by grace and faith. They're getting in by grace and faith. And why would it be otherwise? We couldn't do it the old way either. Why should they be? We, let's don't put them under a yoke that we're glad to be out from under. And we're still early in church development. We don't have the depth of Paul's teaching on grace, but we're in the early developmental stages of really understanding that Jews and Gentiles are being brought in together by Jesus. We're going to be saved the same manner as that they are. Quite a statement, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declare how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. I would love to hear those stories. That's a verse I would love to get to have been a fly on the wall and hear Paul and Barnabas. Early stages of ministry. Paul's been out there preaching this gospel. Paul has had his own period of exile, by the way. In the interim, between the 10th and 15th chapters, Paul is saved. And Paul comes out like gangbusters preaching. And he's dangerous. And the disciples get together and put him on a boat and send him away. And he stays gone for a decade plus, because he needs to tamp down a little bit. Actually, what happens is he goes away for a decade plus and he has a revelation of Jesus and he comes back with the message of grace. And it's a good example of sometimes you have good things to say, but you don't have the right platform to say them. And you have to earn the room. And Paul hadn't earned the room. Everyone was too scared of Paul. He's still, as far as they're concerned, there's still blood on his hands. He's still too fresh from being Saul. And so he spends a decade talking to the Lord. And when he comes back, he's a new man and he's a bold man. And he feels like he's an apostle born out of due time. And he doesn't feel like he has to take a back seat to the Peter and the Jameses and the Johns of the world. And he, you know, he says, I'm a, an apostle with a foremost apostle. And he comes back preaching a message of grace, but he comes back with an uncompromising version of grace. It's the Paul that will go on to write Galatians and go, look, if you're going to be circumcised, you got to keep the whole law. We can't play around with this. You can't be one thing and the other thing. And that's the Paul that we all sort of know and love. That Paul's on his, he's, he's, he's fresh on the missionary field at this point. So I don't know what all he's done, but I know that Paul's going to, we're, the, the scripture's going to take off right after this and really follow Paul because he's going to take this message of grace with him. But this is the great conflict at this point. Verse 13. And after they had become silent, notice there's this silence, talk, silence, talk. They're all processing. They're listening both to each other and to the Holy Spirit. James, who, by the way, at this point is the leader of the early church, undoubtedly the leader. We don't look at James that way. They did. James, uh, most likely James, the brother of Jesus. Um, not for sure on that because that's all over the map. Is James the guy that wrote the book of James, the brother of Jesus? Some scholars say yes, some scholars say no. We don't know for sure. What we do know is that this guy is sort of the foremost Jew of his day, and he's sort of the leader of Israel. And so when he talks, they listen. And he says, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared, Simon is Peter. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Next verse. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up. Verse 17, let's close this segment. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. You go back one, I want to put 16, 17 together. Watch what James, this is James' conclusion. James has been sitting in this meeting the whole time. He hears Peter talk about Gentiles getting saved. Paul talks about Gentiles getting healed. And James stands up and goes, you know what? Here's what I think. The words of the prophets agree. Now look at the quote mark at the top of 16. 
So now you're actually hearing something that's pre-written. James, who's been sitting and listening, talk silent, talk silent. The text does that to you over like a roller coaster. And in those moments of silence, the Holy Spirit speaks to James, brings back a text he remembers. They don't carry a Bible with them. So James doesn't sit there during the meeting looking up scripture. Something comes back to him that he's heard as a child, something that he learned as he was learning Torah and the prophets and the law. And what it is, is, this, is an obscure verse, one that doesn't get any play until this moment, really, in, in scripture. After this, I will return and rebuild, and then he throws in this interesting statement, the tabernacle of David. And the interesting thing is, there is no official tabernacle of David in the Old Testament. There's a tabernacle in the wilderness. Moses builds a tabernacle, and they carry it with them from town to town and spot to spot, cloud by day, fire by night. Fire goes and moves, you move. Fire stops, you stop. Put the Ark of the Covenant there. Cloud moves, you move. And they follow him all over the place, all through the wilderness. There's no real tabernacle of David, not in a formal sense. So what is he talking about? But what, th after this, I'm going to return and rebuild the tabernacle of David. I'm going to rebuild its ruins. Look at what the tabernacle of David will do, verse 17. So that the rest of mankind get to seek the Lord. Who's the rest of mankind? Even all the Gentiles. So as... James hears Peter tell the story of Cornelius. You mean all those Italians got the Holy Spirit? They're not even Jewish. How did that happen? And then Paul and Barnabas stand up and go, oh, all these Gentiles, they all got healed. And, and the Spirit moved. And, and James is thinking, how's that possible? How's it possible that Peter saw Gentiles saved? Paul and Barnabas are seeing Gentiles. You know what I think? I think that this is fulfillment of an old scripture I remember my grandpa used to tell me about, or something along those lines, because he's not sitting and looking it up, but something pops in him because he knows there's a text in the Old Testament where Gentiles get to call on the name of the Lord. And for him, it looks like what he remembers to be called the tabernacle of David. Here's where he's quoting Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. This is probably one of those books you haven't spent a whole lot of time with. Amos is what we call a minor prophet. We only call him that because his book's short, not because he's not important. And remember that, when you hear major prophet, minor prophet, major prophet doesn't mean this one was really big and important, and then this one was really little and not important. It just means one of them wrote was more long-winded than the other one. So the major prophets, they like to write. On that day I will raise up, this is, this is Old Testament. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages, raise up its ruins, rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, that all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Now, the wording's a little different in Acts than it is in Amos. That's because James is working off of the Septuagint, which is translated from the Greek. You're working off of what was translated from the Hebrew, but it's the same basic thing. What James sees is that someday there's going to be a tabernacle set up that is like the tabernacle of David. So, what is that? And what made James think of it? I think this is the key to why David is a man after God's own heart. Because David began to understand something about the Ark of the Covenant and about the presence of God. Let me slow down for a moment, make sure we have this, perf this understanding that if we don't have this, then none of, nothing else I'm about to say is going to make any sense. So let's get this baseline knowledge. Israel had built under God's instruction to the, to the square inch a box called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was acacia wood overlaid with gold. It had a lid on top of it that was removable so that the inside of it literally worked as the Hebrew word for Ark, coffin. And so it worked as a coffin. Whatever went on to the inside of, what, what, what's put on the inside of a coffin? Something that's dead that you don't need to look at anymore. And so there were several things to be placed inside the coffin. A copy of the Ten Commandments went inside the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's rod that budded after Korah's rebellion went inside the Ark of the Covenant. An omer of manna, that is one-tenth measurement. A tithe of manna went inside the Ark of the Covenant, which tells me that there were some things that God used as metaphoric symbols that were supposed to stay inside a coffin. On top of the coffin were two golden cherubims, whose wings touched one another over the top of that box. And on that box was where the blood was sprinkled 
of our story from last month on the Day of Atonement when the high priest would bring the blood of the goat into the holy place and he would sprinkle the blood onto the Ark of the Covenant. And if he walked back out, it meant God had accepted his sacrifice. And so the blood sat on the top, which was called the mercy seat. Mercy seat in the Greek was always translated in the Septuagint as the word propitiation. So when the New Testament calls Jesus your propitiation, it's calling Jesus your mercy seat. That Jesus sets as the very essence of the justice system of God. That the blood of Jesus rests between the cherubims underneath the cloud and the fire. Jesus then comes to represent the very holiest of God. He is the very representation of who God is. And he sets on top of man's rebellion, provision by manna, Ten Commandments. So there's a, there's a lot of tributaries you could say there. Maybe he sets on the tithe and he sets on man's justice and he sets on the law for performance. But all of the things that are in that box are covered by the blood of Jesus. And that box, prior to the blood of Jesus, is the representation of God on the earth for Israel. They pick it up and they carry it with them on, on poles that run through rings on the side of that box. Four men carry it. It was to never be carried by anything but the priesthood. When David takes the throne, the Ark of the Covenant is not in Jerusalem and he wants it because it represents the presence of God. Why wouldn't you want it in Jerusalem? That's where God should be living. I want to build a house for God. Let's bring God home. I'm king. I want God in the same town I'm in. So he goes and finds the Ark of the Covenant, which has sort of been pushed aside. He puts it on a cart and he rolls it into town. And as it's rolling into town, the oxen hit a rock and the cart shakes and the ark begins to fall off. And a man named Uzzah runs up and puts his hand against the ark to keep it from falling. We know the story, but I'm recounting it so we get it fresh in our head. And he pushes the ark back up on the cart and he falls over dead because you can't touch the ark of, of God. And David is frustrated. The Bible actually says David was angry at God. So David goes off in his tent and has a fit doesn't know what to do. And so he puts the ark at the nearest house, which happens to be the house of a non-Israelite, a Gentile, literally a Gittite by the name of Obed-Edom. And they pull the ark of the covenant into Obed-Edom's parlor, take it off the cart and set it in the floor in his living room and leave. Because if God's going to kill somebody for touching this thing, we're not going to put it in the house of one of our brothers. We'll put it in the house of one of our enemies. There's your man after God's own heart. <laughs> and so David goes back to Jerusalem, figures out, we'll figure it out. I don't know what to do. I tried to bring it in. Somebody fell over dead. Put it in that dude's living room. Let's see what happens. It stays there for 90 days. At the end of three months, the reports start coming into David that says, great favor has hit the house of Obadiah. David starts to put two and two together. I dropped the Ark of the Covenant off in his house. His harvest does well. His kids do good in school. Everybody's healthy. The guy's making more money than ever before. He's favored. He's blessed going in, coming out. Remember all those things we were supposed to be as God's people? I'll make you the head, not the tail. This dude, Obed-Edom, who's a Gentile, he's not even one of the sons of God. He's being blessed because this is in his parlor. And David starts to realize, you know, maybe, maybe the key is finding out how to get that Ark of the Covenant out of Obed-Edom's house and into my house. Because if that's going to happen to a guy that's not even a, a, a brother of ours, he's not even in our family, he's not a, an Israelite, well, then we need it. And so David goes back and he scours the records to find out that he wasn't supposed to be putting it on a cart. And he sends some priests out, some Levites, into the home of Obed-Edom, and they pick the Ark up. And now he's so concerned about formula that every six steps they stop and sacrifice a lamb. Six more steps, stop, sacrifice a lamb, six more. They do this all the way back to Jerusalem. And when they get the Ark of the Covenant back, David makes a decision. He doesn't have a tabernacle because they're not wandering in the wilderness, so they don't have tabernacles. He hasn't built a house. There is no temple. So what's he going to do? First Chronicles chapter 16 is the recounting of this story. And I brought you right up to this moment. So they brought, verse 1, so they brought the Ark of God and set it in the middle of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. David just puts up a tent. He doesn't follow the mosaic. There's no indication he follows the mosaic word for how to build a tent. He puts up a tent, and he sticks the tabernacle inside of it. 
Because David's thinking, well, if it blessed Obadiah and he's not even one of us, what would happen if we put up our own tent, just put the Ark of the Covenant in it and see what occurs? And then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Verse 3. Then he distributed to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to every one a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. 5. Asaph the chief, next to him Zechariah, Jael, Shemarath, Jehiel, Matathai, Eliab, Benaiah, Obadidim. Pulls a Gentile in. Because heck, I mean, you were blessed for 90 days having it in your house. You must be doing something right. God must not hate you as much as we thought God hated non-Jews. So tell you what, why don't you come and join the crew that works in front of the Ark of the Covenant Jael with stringed instruments and harps. He sets up a whole band. Asaph made music with cymbals. Benaiah, Jehazel, the priest, regularly blew trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Israel gets blessed with food. Israel gets blessed with praise. They don't sacrifice lambs in front of it. He doesn't build a burnt offering, a burnt altar. He doesn't build a brazen laver. He doesn't put a golden candlestick in there. He doesn't put the shoe bread. All the stuff you're supposed to do in the tabernacle, none of it. He puts a tent and an ark and has people play music out in front of it. And all of Israel, including a Gentile, get to walk in front of that tent and praise God in front of the tent that David puts up for the Ark of the Covenant. And the text said it was a tabernacle that David had thrown. And this vanishes from the biblical record until Amos, an obscure minor prophet, says, someday God's going to rebuild the kind of tabernacle that takes in Edomites and Gentiles. Remember when, remember when Amos said Edomites? Why Edomites? Because there's a dude that used to work there called Obed-Edom, Obed of Edom, a non-Jew. And God's going to reconstruct that kind of tabernacle someday. First, First Chronicles 17, verse 1. Now it came to pass, when David was dwelling in his house, this is the next chapter, David said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. By the, there's David's tabernacle, by the way. I'm living in a real house. The tent, the Ark of God's out here in the yard with a tent around it. This isn't right. Verse 2. And Nathan said to David, Do all that's in your heart, for God is with you. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan and said, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, You shall not build me a house to dwell in. Now, we're in verse 4. I want you to jump ahead just a little bit to verse 10. I'm going to subdue your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord's going to build you a house. What was verse 4? Don't build me a house. What's verse 10? I'm going to build you a house. So God comes to David and says, Forget about the, the tabernacle being out there in a tent. I don't care. You know what I want to do? I want to build a house for you to live in. You're worried about building a house for me to live in? Your kid will take care of that. He tells him, Solomon will build me a temple. Let Solomon do it. I don't want you to build me a house, David. I want to build you a house. I want to develop a place for you to dwell. Jesus, the ultimate son of David, comes and says, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house are many abodes. If a man loves my father, my father and I love him and we make our abode in him. When Jesus went to the cross, he went to build a house, not just for David, but for all the Obed-Edoms of the world. Because the heart of God was not that God has a house to live in. The heart of God was that you have a house to live in, in his heart. So I'm going to build a house with you. You and I are going to dwell together. So this was the heartbeat of God. The heart of God was always open access. Never separation. God never wanted to be separate from man. His heart was always unity with humanity. Never a distance. Not even when Adam sinned in the garden. Christ's death on the cross was meant to tear away any and all thoughts of separation between your consciousness and God's goodness. Amen. The veil of the tabernacle that hid the Ark of the Covenant 
was a representation of that separation. The reason I said not even in the garden is when Adam fails, he hides from God. God doesn't hide from him. Adam hides in the bushes and puts fig leaves on. God comes into the cool of the day to have a conversation with Adam. Because sin didn't run God off. Sin ran man off. Sin has always run man off. Sin has never ran God off. God's not surprised by you, shocked by you, or disappointed with you. It was never the heart of God to be separated from you. It was never the heart of God for you and Him to have this great chasm of guilt and shame and fear and regret between you and God. It was God's heart, as it is any parent's heart, to find wherever their child is, wherever they're hurting, wherever they're lonely, wherever they're cold, wherever they failed, and bridge the gap and go bring them back and say it doesn't have to be that way. And to, to emphasize the gap so that you prove something to the person on the other side isn't a heart of love. But why would God point out the gap and say, see what you've done? Now, spend your entire life trying to make it back over here to me. And that's how man treated the law. They took the law and went, well, if we could just keep it, God would be happy with us. But he was always happy with them. The law wasn't God's way of trying to get you to be pleased by God. It was just to keep you from killing your neighbor and, for, and made you take care of people you didn't care about. That's all the law was meant to do. Like, if I don't give you the law, you don't have the Holy Spirit, so you won't take care of this guy over here. You'll just abandon him. And that's exactly what we do. Now, I got an impetus to do it. I have a law to do it. Okay, well, we have to take care of him. Then the Holy Spirit comes in and the new covenant says, here's how you know you're one of his kids. You love people. Not you love people so you can be one of his kids. You love people and that shows you you're one of his kids. Why? The law couldn't do that. The law told you what to do. Didn't make your heart change towards doing it. But the Spirit of God does. And so the, the Holy Spirit comes in bridging all of the gaps. It was never the heart of God to be separate from man. So when God has them build the tabernacle or the temple, they put a veil. They build a curtain that goes from the top of the ceiling to the floor. Behind that curtain sits the Ark of the Covenant. And the high priest can go in that once a year on the Day of Atonement. And that veil is representative of every ounce of separation between the consciousness of man and the holiness of God. Behind the curtain is the holiness of God. And out in front is the activity of man. Man's out there working. He's not in here working. He doesn't come in here to work. He comes in here and puts blood and he backs out. This place is holy. You don't work in here. You work out there. You work it out out there. That's your consciousness running around out there. That's you killing lambs and washing your hands and eating showbread and lighting candles. In here, you don't do anything. This is the seat of God. And there's a big curtain in between what you do and who he is. And that curtain represents the chasm in your own mind. And then Jesus goes to the cross, Matthew 27. Jesus cries out again with a loud voice. And yields up his spirit. And then behold, and what a verse this is. <laughs> behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. What the author's conveying to you is that what happens on the cross is not only is your sin and your evil judged in Jesus, but what happens on the cross is the, the veil that had separated your consciousness from the very goodness of God, your activity from his holiness. God ripped that in half. And he did it literally in the temple so that it could be done spiritually inside of your temple so that you would say, nothing ever, ever, ever again is going to separate me from how good my father is. I'm not going to allow my thoughts and my failures and my past and my stuff and my, my, my guilt and my shame. and You insert you because you got all this stuff out here. I'm not going to let anything keep me from his presence. And when the veil is rent because of the cross, it's God saying to man, there's nothing left to separate you and I. There's no reason why you and I are not together in this. Now, when James hears the Peter testimony, Gentiles were getting the Holy Spirit. And Paul and Barnabas, Gentiles have been getting healed. Gentiles are getting saved. I'm baptizing non-Jews. They're receiving Christ. James says, you know what? This reminds me of a verse I heard about the tabernacle of David. That's where I want to close. We already read it once, but I just want, now that you've had that whole story, I want you to see it again. After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I'm going to rebuild its ruins. I will set it up. I will set it up. It's not a temple you're going to build in Jerusalem. It's not going to happen on a piece of property. I'm going to build it. 
It's going to be the kind of tent that allows a man named Obadiah to work there. It's not going to have a sacrificial altar out front of it. We're not going to put golden candlesticks. I'm not going to build a big curtain called the veil. I'm not going to make you wear bells and go in there once a year. It's going to be like David's. What happened at David's tabernacle? We put a band out front. People came by, they sang, they danced, and they rejoiced. They rejoiced, and they enjoyed themselves, Jews and Gentiles, all rejoicing in front of the same altar. God says, I'm going to rebuild it. And James doesn't say this happens 2,000 years into the future, 3,000 years in the future, 4,000. James says, you know what, guys? I've been sitting here listening. I have a feeling God is rebuilding a tabernacle, the one David put up. I think the fact that Gentiles get in is an indication that God's heart is not to rebuild a temple on the earth or have one people over another people. God's heart is to go back to the way David did it. David put a tent around the ark, but he didn't put a veil in front of it. The indication is, is that David left the tent flap door open so that you could come and rejoice in front of the temple and take a look at the ark in the place of God's glory and go back home with your food and your blessing and a heart full of joy. I think when the Bible says David is a man after God's own heart, it's not because he's a warrior or a shepherd. It's not because he's good at repenting or he prays new covenant prayers. It's because he took the glory of God and he made it accessible for the Obadidims of the world. And that was God's heart. God's heart has never been David over Obadidim. His heart is David and Obadidim. I want both of them. I want the Jew and the Gentile. I want all colors. I want all languages. I want all classes. I want, I want you, regardless of your background and your past, I want you, if, whether you're educated or non-educated, I want you if you're ambitious or lazy, doesn't matter to me. I want all of them. There are a rainbow of people, and I want a rainbow of people to be able to come to me. And I can't do that if I put a bunch of formula in front of the ark. And I can't do that if I put a curtain in front of the ark. Because you're going to judge yourself based on your... So what we're going to do is we're going to tear it all down. And I'm not going to rebuild a building. I'm going to rebuild David's building. It wasn't really a building at all. It was just a tent. And it housed the glory, but the glory can't be contained. And you got to party in front of it. And the Obadidim stood on the same ground as the Davids of the world. It had never happened that way before in Israel. And it never happened that way since until Acts 15. And that's what James thought. I think the reason they're coming home is that God has rebuilt the temple on the earth. The reason I showed you that text from Chronicles where David wanted to build a house and God said, no, I'm going to build you a house. is because I think that's been the heart of God forever. Okay. It's not for you to build him a house. He's been building you a house. When he put Adam in the Garden of Eden, he didn't say, now you build me a spot and I'll come down here and live with you. No, God built him a spot and came down and lived with him. I built this for you. I don't need a garden. I know you need a garden. And I want you to fill the earth. And I want you to enjoy this place. And I'll walk with you every day. And you and I will get to explore this thing together. And then sin came, and man separated himself from God. But notice the Genesis story. God went out of the garden with Adam. God was always a step behind Adam. He was always chasing us. He wasn't shoving us. He was always we were always running from him. He was always a step behind us, just chasing us down with his love, chasing us down with his passion, chasing us down with his heart. And he caught us at the cross. Finally, he stepped into us in the form of Jesus, and he caught us at Calvary. And it's so stunning, it blows our mind, because when you get to see God do this as a man, you don't understand him. He doesn't respond to, to, to people the way we have, and he doesn't talk the way we talk, and he doesn't act the way we act. It's because we've, he's been chasing us for so long, we never looked over our shoulder and saw what a real man looked like until we saw Jesus. And Jesus stuns us. Smite him on the cheek, he turns the other one. Ask me to carry it a mile, I'll carry it too. I mean, nothing he says ever makes sense to us. Really, how he forgives people, how he loves people, how he accepts people, none of it makes sense. It's the antithesis of everything we think you should do in the world. He does it exactly opposite. Mm. It just shows you that our expectations of God have always been wrong as well. 
Because Jesus comes and he looks completely different. And when he goes to the cross, one of those final strokes is as his breath leaves his lungs, the veil is rent. It's torn from top to bottom. It's, it's top to bottom because it's a sign of God reaching down and tearing it. Man could tear it from the floor up, but no one could get to the top of the ceiling to tear it. And the scripture made it clear that it was torn from top to bottom because the point of that was that it took an act of God to shatter this curtain so that you, couldn't have, you wouldn't have guilt and think, maybe I'm still separated. No, you're not separated. So what's it take to be a man after God's own heart? Man after God's own heart sees a God who doesn't recognize one person over the other. Who doesn't see one person more loved, one person more accepted. God's heart is that they are all loved. They are all accepted. That, and I, I'm not arguing against the other interpretations. You know, David, all of these things that made David special. Absolutely. But what perked, piqued the interest of that first generation church about David was James doesn't stand up and go, you know, our God's like David because he's a giant killer. No, it was that moment David stuck the ark in a tent and that rang a bell and said, that's the heart of God. That everybody, everybody gets free access. I've been pretty infatuated with the Obadidim story for, for a long time now that God would throw this story into the Bible of a guy who gets the Ark of the Covenant in his front room and for 90 days heaven lives on his earth. And he didn't earn it, he didn't deserve it, and he couldn't even have known what was going on. Now, do you think anybody touched it when it was in his living room? I've always, I've always preached it this way. I think his kids dip their chicken nuggets in ketchup on top of it. I mean, I do. I think that, the, the, that it was not about, oh, it's too holy to touch. No, David had brought it in with a... David, the method David brought it in was not the method God had told them to bring it in. And Uzzah dies. I preached a sermon years ago. I never heard anybody else see it this way, and I've wrestled with this many times. But I think Uzzah dies as a type of Christ. I think Uzzah reaches up and saves Israel. And one man dies for them all. And out of Uzzah's death comes a resurrection of who, the, who God is. Because what happens on the other side of Uzzah's death is the tabernacle of David. And I think Uzzah is the type of Christ leaches his hand up on the Ark of the Covenant and dies on your behalf so that you can have a resurrection of reality that God's heart was that you get to come into the heart of God. I, that's my own thought. I don't think it was because, oh, the, you know, the, the outside. It's not like Raiders of the Lost. Anybody remember Indiana Jones? And then and they open their eyes, and then the, the lasers come out and fry everybody up. Indy's like, keep your eyes closed. Don't look at it. That was some pretty cool special effects, too, by the way. And they all, like, melt. And then they're just skeletons, and they fall over. It's pretty cool. But I don't think that's what happened. But, no, I think Obadidim's kids run around and play on the ark and, yeah, they, they dip their food in the, the french fries and the ketchup and, uh, you know, that's setting on top of it. I, my point is, is that they didn't look at this as some object they can't touch. They, they saw it as a conduit to the heart of God, favors in this house because of the presence of God. And that's what David got jealous. David said, man, I can't let this guy get all that. We need that. And the heart of God, I would have thought, I'm going to put this in my living room, right? Then in Obed-Edom's house, what if I put it in my house? David, here's why he's the man after God's own heart. He doesn't put it in his living room. He puts it outside with a tent, opens the flap, and lets everybody come see it. Because he's like, what if everyone had access to that like Obadidim did? And that was Acts 15. That was where James went, I think everybody's supposed to have access. That's the tabernacle of David. Amen, Amen indeed. What well, good news. Good news. Thank you, Father, for this word, and thank you for the joy that this has has brought up in my spirit tonight. I, I've enjoyed the reflection in your word and, and seeing this with new eyes. I pray that we have shined a bright light on the finished work and made what you, you did for us on the cross of the first importance. Now, we will leave this room tonight with a, a, an excitement that we too have access, unfettered, unrestricted access to the goodness of God that if a David and an Obadidim 
both get the same favor. We can get the favor of God simply by believing that Jesus has torn down any separation and that we get it through him. Thank you. Just as Peter and James said in Acts 15, we perceive that there's no difference in us and them. Thank you that there's no difference. We receive the same Jesus today in Jesus' name. Amen.